All right, we'll be starting today in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Before the main message today, I have some comments regarding the events of the past week on the world scene. I'm actually preparing a message to hopefully bring next week to conclude our a series of messages on the error of historicist eschatology. I still have part seven to do. That series of messages has been somewhat interspersed between several other messages over the past uh, few months, actually. Uh, I wanted to come back to the topic sooner, but we've had some other important issues to deal with. But on this topic, eschatology, many Christians today have been blinded by the false system of historicist eschatology into dangerously misinterpreting current events and characters on the world stage, I believe, in light of the teachings of Scripture. Many professing Christians actually deceived by either the preterist or the historicist system of eschatology have been particularly blinded uh, to the prophetic significance of the demand for global hegemony that drives the politicians and the power elite of Washington, D.C. In other words, their demand for a global empire, uh, devoid of any competition or challenge to America's place of dominance in the world. Of course, uh, far too many professing Christians today are too blind to even see there's a problem. Uh, many, as we touched on last week, not only approve of, but even rejoice in the American war agenda, cheering it on and in fact, thinking that they're standing for Israel and somehow doing God's service and so doing. Many other Christians have their eyes wide open to see the problem, the insanity of America's war agenda, but they fail to grasp the spiritual or the prophetic significance or to see that America's clearly globalist agenda is based on the fact that the power elite that controls Washington, D.C. are literal and cognizant servants of their father, Lucifer, and are thereby totally, literally hell-bent on building and bringing to pass the very global empire that John prophesied over 1,900 years ago in the book of Revelation, especially chapter 13. And the events of this past week, with Donald Trump's much-boasted and self-proclaimed victory in single-handedly solving the North Korea nuclear problem, as he claims, after traveling to Singapore to meet and to sign an agreement with North Korea's ruthless, murderous dictator Kim Jong-un, only serves really to put Americans back to sleep, thinking all is well and all is right with the American agenda, and thinking that we will have peace for our time. We're going to have peace for our time, those being, of course, the famous words, maybe the famous last words that British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain said. He declared after he met with Adolf Hitler and signed the Munich Agreement of September 1938, which words he had to eat then less than a year later when Hitler invaded Poland and declared war uh, soon thereafter on France and Britain. Trump's self-proclaimed victory of peace here, I believe, is far from realized, of course, and he actually may end up eating his words just like Chamberlain did, since actually this agreement is really only an agreement for each side to work towards an agreement for North Korea to give up its nuclear arsenal. There's nothing really cast in concrete yet. This past Friday morning, Mary and I watched closely as Mr. Trump gave an impromptu uh, interview to Fox News Live in which Trump lavished praise on Kim Jong-un, calling him funny and smart uh, and saying that Kim loves his people. And by the way, this is Trump's assessment of a man who, in his first five years in power, has personally ordered the executions of at least 340 people, 140 of which were senior officers uh, in the country's government and military, one of which was a top education official who was executed by firing squad after he exhibited a bad attitude at the Supreme People's Assembly. Kim's defense minister was executed in May 2015 with an anti-aircraft gun, at Pyongyang Military School before an audience called assembled for that purpose. Uh, Trump says this man is funny and smart and loves his people. He's the head of the country, Trump said, and I mean he's the strong head. Don't let anyone think anything different. He speaks and his people sit up at attention, Trump said. 
Well, now I wonder why that is. You know, I think. Oh, exactly. Trump said he speaks and his people sit up in attention. And then Trump said, I want my people to do the same. I want my people to do the same. Trump later reportedly said that last statement was just a joke. It was only sarcasm. Uh, first of all, Kim Jong-un's dictatorial power over the oppressed people of North Korea is not a laughing matter and is really nothing to be joking about. Secondly, Mary and I were watching uh, and we heard Mr. Trump make this insidious comment Friday uh, live on Fox News, and I'll show you it was no joke. He, Trump was completely straight-faced and serious when he said that. The Bible says that men that make such comments and then say, I was only kidding, are madmen. Proverbs 26, verse 18 says, As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is a man that deceiveth his neighbor, his neighbor and saith, am I in sport? Oh, I was only kidding. Trump said, he speaks and his people sit up at attention. I want my people to do the same. This is the mental state of the man that now occupies the White House. That's how the man thinks. He's a highly narcissistic megalomaniac. Personally, I don't know that Kim Jong-un poses near the threat to world peace that Adolf Hitler posed in 1938. But I definitely don't believe that we'll have peace for our time as a result of this purported agreement with North Korea. And I think actually the whole thing may be set up for a double cross. We'll see where things go. But now, uh, since North Korea actually now has ICBMs that can reach even to the east coast of the United States, I believe we should still be prepared for an EMP strike that could wipe out the power grid and water supply in America for up to a year. We should be prepared for that. So that's my present analysis of Trump's premature boasting of his great peace victory. I would add, I would greatly rejoice to see American military forces withdrawn from the Korean Peninsula and brought home. That would be cause to rejoice. I'd also add that I actually do applaud Trump's action last weekend, just before going to Singapore, and his refusal to sign on to an extremely globalist G7 resolution known as the G7 Charlevoix Communique, uh, for which Trump was blasted by California Senator Dianne Feinstein. And whenever a politician is being blasted by Bilderberg Senator Dianne Frankenstein, there's almost uh, a certainty that's for doing something good. The G7 resolution that Trump rejected endorses the World Trade Organization, the UN's Agenda 2030, the UN's fraudulent Paris Agreement on Global Warming, the UN's phony sustainable development programs, global surveillance, all kinds of things that America should not have anything to do with. So I would definitely applaud Mr. Trump for refusing to sign on to that agreement, but we'll see where that goes also. But for that reason and a couple of others, I'm not quite ready to sign on with uh, those that dogmatically say that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. Uh, although I'd still say for many other reasons that is a distinct possibility and I think is, in fact, a much more likely possibility than the Pope of Rome fulfilling that role. I still say for many reasons, as I've said many times before, that when he does come, the Antichrist, I do believe, will come to power through the office that Mr. Trump now holds. And I believe it's important to remember that the Bible says of the Antichrist, he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. That means he'll come promising peace, but will bring war instead. We read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 4. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as at the day of Christ at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, says Paul. Don't let John Nelson Darby deceive you. Don't let C.I. Schofield deceive you. Don't let J. Vernon McGee uh, deceive you, and don't let Peter Ruckman deceive you. For that day shall not come. In other words, there will be no rapture of the church except there come a falling away first. Amen. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalts himself above all that's called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Lord willing, I'm going to have much more to say on this next week when I actually hope to present more proof and show conclusively that this passage was not fulfilled in history uh, and remains entirely yet to be fulfilled 
And further, why I believe we must conclude that though as extremely antichrist as the office of the papacy has been through the centuries, John said at the time of his writing that uh, even now there are many antichrists. But for many reasons, I do believe that we must conclude uh, that the man of sin in this passage has not been and will not be the Pope of Rome. And also that the temple of God in this passage is not the church, whether a universal church or a local. It's not the same temple of God that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 6 as the heart or the body of the individual believer in which the Holy Ghost has taken up residence. It's also, I don't believe, a combination of all these things that some are arguing today as if to try to appease all opposing views on the topic. But this passage refers, I believe, to one specific earthly temple that must yet be built in the city of Jerusalem and also to one specific event that the Bible says will take place in that location at one specific time. And there has ne- that event has never been yet fulfilled in history. And I believe, as James talked about earlier, the purpose of that, the purpose of which is, from at least from God's perspective, I do believe, in his eternal plan, is indeed to bring about the restoration of Israel and the Jews that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 11. So Lord willing, I'll have more on that next week.